Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure. I'm very happy to be back with you again tonight. I'm eager to get going again with um, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1 is where we are in this study. And uh, we have uh, Brother Matthias here producing the program as usual. Brother Cripps uh, here is with me already. And Sister Renee is on her way. She'll be joining us any minute. Okay, let's first, uh, Brother Cripps, you want to say hi to everybody? You know I do. Hello, everybody. I'm uh, happy to be here again for another uh, Bible study and starting a new chapter, which is great. I think there's a few people, at least, that are looking forward to this, uh, I being one of them. And uh, gosh, there's just, I um, uh, uh, just want to say hello to everyone in the chat. And I'm sure Renee will be here soon. And I just really look forward to these uh, broadcasts. So um, can't wait to get into it. Thanks. Yes. All right, brother. Thank you. Um, all right. Hello to the chat room. I'm glad you're here with, again, with us again. And uh, uh, if, if anybody is uh, watching right now for the first time, uh, welcome. I hope that uh, tonight is a, a good time for you, and maybe if you enjoy it, you'll want to come back every Wednesday. Uh, we not only have a Wednesday Bible study, but we have a live church service uh, every Sunday at 5 p.m. Eastern time. And uh, we also have a real fun time every Friday night it's called Fellowship Friday. So I invite you to join us for all those programs. <clears throat> and. Uh, Let's, let's go ahead and get started right now. We're on uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. I'll read it first in the KJV for you, uh, Brother Cripps. Okay. It says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and continuing into verse 2 and 3 and 4. It says, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Mm -hmm. All right, Brother Cripps, can you uh, translate that from the uh, old English for us? Mm. I think I would rather hear the Amplified in this, these these four, Brother Luke, if you don't mind. Well, you know, that's what I was thinking. I mean, yeah. If we had Renee right now, she'd probably be eager to go ahead and, uh, you know, uh, make sense of that KJV. But uh, let's let's take advantage of the Amplified here. Okay. I think this is one of those times that we, we need it and it'll be helpful. So here, a little poetic. Yeah. Here it is for the first four verses in the Amplified. It says, for I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren that our forefathers were all under and protected by the cloud in which God's presence went before them. And every one of them passed safely through the Red Sea. And each one of them allowed himself also to be baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They were thus brought under obligation to the law, to Moses and to the covenant consecrated and set apart to the service of God. And all of them ate the same spiritual, uh, su supernaturally given food, and they all drank the same spiritual, that's supernaturally given drink, for they drank from a spiritual rock which followed them, uh, produced by the sole power of God himself without natural instrumentality. And the rock was Christ. Okay. Um, we know that uh, we know that the God led them uh, in that way and having the cloud and uh, we know about them drinking from the rock. Um, what's interesting is he says that rock, that spiritual rock uh, was Christ. Um, I think there's probably a lot of people who don't understand this, don't understand that, that Jesus was there from the beginning and uh, that he uh, has many appearances uh, uh, through scripture. Uh, and I, uh, Paul's saying that here, he's, he's making this point clear. Now it should be clear to a lot of people he's talking to probably, well, that remains to be seen. Um, but the part I don't understand, he says, he says, for I do not want you to be unaware 
that our fathers were all under the cloud. So maybe they don't know. He's saying, I don't want you to be unaware. So so maybe he's he's getting ready to explain something in greater detail that he hasn't touched on before. Um, I love the story about the rock and how the water came out of it and the people were thirsty and um, and then uh, Moses was supposed to talk gently to the rock, but instead he struck it and uh, he paid consequences for that. Uh, so if the rock was Christ, then that makes a, a better explanation of maybe why God was was upset that Moses, other than just not obeying exactly what he said. I'll leave that open for, for your comment, Brother Luke, but Renee just popped in as well. Okay, no, thank you, Brother hey! Okay, <laughs> Renee, we just read the uh, First Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. And in both the KJV, it was a little complicated, so we already looked at the Amplified. But I, I think that uh, there's a lot of references here uh, uh, to, uh, of course, the Old Testament events. Mm -hmm. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, look at these um, NABRE footnote here. You want to go ahead and go, and I'll just go last? I just came in. Yeah, that's what okay. I'm doing. That's what I'm doing. I'm looking at the footnotes now in the NABRE for verses one through five. And it, it, it says, uh, verses one through five, Paul embarks unexpectedly upon a panoramic survey of the events of the Exodus period. The privileges of Israel in the wilderness are described in terms that apply strictly only to the realities of the new covenant, and that is baptism, spiritual food and drink interpreted in this way they point forward to the christian experience but those privileges did not guarantee god's permanent pleasure and then a, another footnote specifically on verse four says a spiritual rock that followed them the torah speaks only about a rock from which water issued but rabbinic legend amplified this into a spring that followed the Israelites throughout their migration. Paul mm -hmm. uses this legend as a literary type. Mm -hmm. He makes the rock itself accompany the Israelites mm -hmm. and he gives it a spiritual sense. The rock was the Christ in the Old Testament. Yahweh is the rock of his people. Mm -hmm. uh, in Deuteronomy, Rose's song to Yahweh, the rock. Uh, Paul now applies this image to the Christ, the source of the living water, the true rock that accompanied Israel, guiding their experiences in the desert. Well, I, I think that was really very helpful, but to Sister Renee, verses one through four, um, yeah. I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. Man, do I love this. I. Okay, for all those that say Jesus is not God and didn't pre-exist, this is the God that Moses saw. Yeah. Jesus, pre-incarnate, Christophany. And for the Catholics that believe Peter is the rock instead of the rock being the revelation given to Peter, and that rock was Christ. You can't get clearer than that. You cannot. Uh, mm -hmm, amen. I, I can't believe Catholics actually believe that Jesus built the foundation of his own church on a human being. <laughs> That's crazy. Wow. And, and by the way, Peter is like a chip off the rock. It's like a stone. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it, the rock is the revelation of who Jesus is that was given to Peter by God. And this section is so amazing because it shows us the old testament coming to life you know as as lou as they all say is the uh, new testament's the old testament uh, uh revealed and vice versa so let me go over here moreover brethren i would not have you to be ignorant how that all our followers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea so and we're also addressing another issue and that is baptism a lot of people believe that water baptism is part of what saves you uh and that he is showing true spiritual baptism the holy spirit baptism is the one baptism because paul talks about how there is only one baptism we are all baptized into christ by what the holy spirit 
Mm. And water baptism is a symbol. Uh, it's a fleshly symbol of the spiritual baptism, such as the Red Sea was a a picture, a shadow of being baptized into Christ. So their baptism, since they were saved looking forward to the cross, it answers another issue. Nobody was ever saved by the law. These people were saved by grace through faith in the finished work of Christ that had not manifested in this time space yet. So they, he was a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So he is looking, they are looking forward to the cross as we look backward to the cross. So they are baptized into Christ through the Red Sea. You see, so he doesn't want them to be ignorant. He doesn't want them, want this to slip past them. That what happened here was Moses was really a picture of Jesus and being baptized into him. This also, con, you know, really confirms the pre-existence and divinity of Jesus, that Jesus is Yahweh and Yahweh is Jesus or Jehovah or what, however you want to pronounce. yud heh vav -Hey. How about that? We're just spelling the word. So, and it says, all were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So, passing through the Red Sea, uh, uh, being covered by the cloud in the coolness, that was all a picture of Holy Spirit baptism into Jesus. Mm -hmm. Now, did this thing save them? Did walking through the cloud save them? Did passing through the Red Sea save their souls? No, passing through the Red Sea saved their physical lives. Mm -hmm. But it's a picture of what did save them. Mm -hmm. And that is Jesus uh, being baptized into them. And did all eat the same spiritual meat? That's why there's only one baptism into Christ. It's why Paul said, I'm glad I didn't come. I didn't come to baptize, but to preach the gospel. I'm glad I didn't baptize, but one or two that he could remember. Mm -hmm. And did all drink the same spiritual drink? We know that when Moses struck the rock, it uh, living water came out. And Jesus says, you know, uh, that living, whoever believes in him, uh, uh, it will spring up into life everlasting. It's, it's water that you'll never have to um, drink again. Uh, and they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And I think when uh, this is one of the reasons why when Moses struck the rock twice, he wasn't allowed to go into the promised land. He was supposed to speak to the rock because the rock was already struck once and Jesus only had to die one time. And so that rock was a picture of, of uh, God smiting Jesus on the cross for our sins. So when you when he said speak to the rock because it's already been smoked. Moses already hit it and the living water came out. Well, he messed up a shadow, a picture of Jesus's once for all death, sacrificial death. So he wasn't allowed in the promise. And a lot of people think that's a, a harsh, a harsh judgment. I do not think so when considering that the, the picture is to say that Jesus died once for all. So if you smite the rock more than once, it, it the shadow is messed up. Saying that Jesus has to die again and again. Yeah. So that's not that's not what happened. And they drank of that spiritual rock to follow them. And that rock was Peter. That rock <laughs> was Christ. Yes. So I love it. I love it. Talk about a great way to start a Bible study, man. I, I love Amen. it. Amen. I Thank paid for you guys. I paid the way for you a little bit. I said that some people might be excited about this chapter tonight. You think? <laughs> Who are you talking about? Is somebody else coming? <laughs> That's right. Well, um, when you said uh, a chip off the rock, I, 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 it made me think of that uh, saying, he's a chip off the old block. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I I always, whenever I hear a, a, a saying uh, of, I don't know what you call it, a colloquialism or whatever it is, a saying that's popular that people repeat. Uh, I, I habitually look it up and, at, and want to find out the origin of it. It's always very interesting to see the origin of these sayings. And some of it is really very surprising. And the nice thing is with our internet, I just, I'd say to my phone, okay, Google, what's the origin of 
the saying, chip off the old block and, it, yep. and it, it'll tell me. It's that easy to learn these days. Yeah. Uh, so, but, so I don't know if the chip off the old block is a reference to Peter being the little rock, you know, um, um, uh, because we know that uh, there, there is the, the big rock, of course, is, is Christ. And, and Peter is also called Peter or Petra, which is a, a little rock. So I don't I don't know how if that's all a valid point I'm making or not. But uh, what I find really interesting about this part of the scriptures is that um, you've heard me say many times, and of course, Renee and many others, uh, we, we often uh, talk about how um, the, the Old Testament, uh, the gospel and Christ is all through the Old Testament. Um, also, uh, the scriptures say that Paul would routinely Every town he went into, the first thing he would do is go to the synagogues and go through the scriptures, showing them Christ and and that uh, uh, this um, uh, this gospel was in the Old Testament. He would be explaining that to them, and of course, on the road to Emmaus, Jesus explained everything in the Old Testament that was about him. Uh, so uh, the idea. I get a kick out how Matthias is enjoying so much the Old Testament. Uh, I've heard him say several times that um, he enjoys the Old Testament more than the New Testament now. And it is exciting when, when, we, when we really understand the New Testament and then go back and read the Old, man, it's just like one great revelation after another. It's just really, really exciting, these epiphanies of re, re, finally getting what the old... See, the Old Testament cannot be understood unless you understand the New Testament. Um, I, I have a playlist titled um, The Bloody Trail. Uh, it's the, the trail of the blood sacrifice, everything that points to the blood, the shed blood throughout the Old Testament. Uh, and the pictures and shadows of Jesus' blood atonement throughout the Old Testament. I hope everybody will watch that playlist. We we probably cover at least 20 of these um, uh, events in the Old Testament that are showing us the gospel uh, in a picture. Um, but in this portion of scripture here, these first four verses here, there's a lot of that. Paul uses a whole bunch of this stuff, and and uh, some of it, I'm not sure if I've got it right, and, and the the um, the footnotes told me some things I didn't know, but let me say, go through it myself. And the, the, the cloud, how that our fathers were under the cloud. Mm -hmm. Now, the footnote in the NABRE says that this was um, not a biblical reference, but a reference to uh, rabb rabbinical. Let me see how it states it again. I, I don't want to misrepresent how it was stated here it says um the rock was the christ in the old testament uh, okay no okay here it is um a spiritual rock that followed them the torah speaks only about a rock now the torah of course that's the the, the law and the prophets it's, it's all the the 39 books of the old testament that we, we call the old testament so the torah speaks only about a rock from which water issued but rabbinic legend amplified amplified this into a spring that followed the Israelites throughout their migration. Mm -hmm. Now, I thought, or into a spring. Uh, now, a spring, I guess, comes from the ground. Uh, we know that there, I, I misunderstood the footnote when I read it the first time, but uh, the way I understand it is that there was a cloud that followed the Israelites through the desert, uh, and I, I'm assuming that that did provide water, but I don't, maybe not, um, because we know that the water had to come from Moses striking the stone to draw water out of the ground. Uh, so, but getting back to this, these first four verses, the, um, um, the cloud passing through that, it says that they were baptized into Moses. So it's, it's, it's pretty much, uh, Extempted by most uh, Bible scholars that this is a, a pick, this is referenced as baptism because they they had to go through the Red Sea. It's like being immersed into water, even though they didn't get wet. As far as I know, uh, they had to go through the water uh, in order to be saved from the uh, army of Pharaoh. Uh, and then it says uh, the spiritual did eat the same spiritual meat 
Well, we know that the Lord provided them um, some kind of was it some kind of a bird. I forgot what it was, but the, oh, was it a bird? I know that it was manna, but were there also birds that were provided by God too? I think. But the spiritual meat, of course, is the is the flesh of Christ. So this could be a picture of his his uh, uh, his body that was uh, died for us. And then it says, and, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock. So I, I see when Moses struck the rock to, and the water sprang out of it, it was the same as the soldier that, that struck Jesus with the spear and the water came out of his side. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a, a picture of that, as, as I, uh, I'm guessing. Yeah. Uh, and of course, we know that Jesus said, eat his flesh and drink his, his blood and, and does, and he's referred to as the living water and the bread of life. So I think that these, all these things are, uh, we can relate them to, to Jesus and all those references to, to him and what he accomplished. Um, all right, uh, any more thoughts on that, Rene or, or Cripps? Yeah, I just wanna add something really quick, just a really short story. Uh, has anyone uh, actually tasted from a natural spring? I have I mean, once in the Blue Ridge Mountains. It was amazing. I tell my son about it all the time. Well, there you go. Well, that, you, you, you can know what I'm about to, to tell the others. So um, my grandparents on my dad's side, my grandpa Leo, uh, they lived in a, in a place called Gladwin, Michigan, which is almost uh, dead center, literally in the middle of Michigan, almost perfectly. Uh, situated there and just a small town. It was a logging town and um, uh, very, very little bit downtown and, and things like that. They lived about 20 miles out of, out of Gladwin, Michigan and uh, went fishing a lot with my grandpa. And uh, I'll never forget the first time my grandfather took me to a natural spring and it was just, just off the side of the road really. And back then it was a dirt road. Uh, but it was a spring that had been there for, who knows, been there probably for a long time, but it had been discovered. And there was a, um, uh, a, a, an old uh, ladle, like a, like a uh, I don't remember what it was made out of metal or, or, or something uh, that was uh, chained to a rock. And you, you would go over there and you'd have to walk a little bit off the main, the main road through the brush, go back in there, and he knew right where it was. And he dipped that ladle into the spring and it was bubbling a little bit, you know, a little water coming out of the ground. And um, I took a, took a sip of it and I have never before or since tasted water exactly like that. It was so completely refreshing and cold. I've never been able to, to, to match the experience. Ice cold and you ice can't cold. get it that cold with ice. You can't. It's almost like the coldness seeped into the water. It didn't yep. get it cold. It was cold. Yep. Brilliant. It actually had a taste to it that is yep. phenomenal. It, yep. it, I tried to explain it to my son. It was a, it, we can't. We got it as it came out of the side of the mountain. It was coming down the mountain, out the side of it. Wow. You, you can't. Here's the thing, and this just came to me. I. I I, it, it amazed me, Renee, that you brought that you phrased it exactly like that. You cannot explain it to someone that hasn't tried it. You can try, but you just can't quite come up with the words to explain it. And this is the same way of tasting the natural spring of life, the water. Ooh, that praise God. It. We can try to wrap it into words, but you, you really can't know it without experiencing it. Uh, but he is the water. He is yeah. the natural spring. He is something that cannot be faked. It can't be mimicked. It can't be uh, created by anything else. He is the rock. He's the only living water. And that when you taste of it, there there is no substitute. And you have to have more and more and more. And that's why when somebody truly does know the Lord, like they totally get the gospel, you know they're saved and they're walking close to the Lord. You can't, you can't mimic or try to be like Christ. No, he just flows from you. It's something deep within that person. You you don't know how to explain it. 
No. But you know that there is a grace about them, yeah. a forgiveness about them. Mm -hmm. That's why you, you can't replace knowing the true Christ with religion mm -hmm. and rule keeping. You can, if, if that's what you think Christ is, is constant sin consciousness and, and outer righteousness. Oh man, do you know him? You know, it's, it's, He's so amazing. I love how you just explained that. Like you, you can't explain the water unless you drank the, from the water of life freely. Yeah. You, you just can't express it. Mm. Brother Cripps, that, does, that sounds a lot better than that water in Laodicea to me. <laughs> yes. Oh, the lukewarm that you spit Nobody out? Wants that. Yeah. Nobody yeah. wants it. Of course he'd spit it out of his mouth. Nobody wants lukewarm water. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Either it's hot, in which case you can make tea with it, you can have coffee with it. There's all kinds of purposes. Or it's cold. You can put ice in it. It can be cold and refreshing. Uh, you can make iced tea from it, but what does one do with lukewarm water? Mm -hmm. You spit it out. Yeah, it's gross. Nobody wants it. All right, let's go back to the KJV verse 5, Renee. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the desert. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull this up here. Hold on. Let me open my camera. There's a lot there in that one verse. Yeah, boy. Well, you're getting right. it, it tells us that many couldn't enter in because of unbelief. Mm -hmm. You know, so to, what God is not pleased with is when you do not believe him. When he tells you something, when he says he saved you, when he says I came as a man, and lived a perfect sinless life, fulfilled the law in myself. My justice is served. My wrath is quenched. I have brought you nigh to myself. I've obtained eternal redemption for you. And you just won't, you just won't get it. You, you refuse to, well, that, that's not enough. You, you, that, that would mean you could just do this, live whatever you want and get to heaven. And I'm not having that because those people don't deserve it when I do this and that and this. God is not pleased when you don't believe him. Regardless of the Catholics telling you it's a sin of presumption. It's only a presumptuous if you think salvation's about how good you are. Then it would be presumptuous to say, I know I'm going to heaven because you're saying, oh, I know I'm good enough to get there. But when you say, I know I have eternal life, it's because of whom you have believed. It's not presumptuous. It's called faith. It's called taking God at his word and trusting him as your savior. So when he's not pleased, well pleased, is because they did not take him at his word, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. So when you, what, what, what is always the straw that breaks the camel's back, uh, Brother Cripps and Luke, with God? When, when is the last straw broken over and over again with the nation of Israel? What is the sin that they commit that he's finally, I'm done, you're going into judgment? It's adultery. <laughs> yes, adultery with other gods, uh, not having faith in the living God and Unbelief. pouring after other gods. Mm -hmm. What's Absolutely. the only sin that can't be forgiven, Renee? Yeah. Oh, going to your death, uh, uh, not believing. Yeah. Unbelief, that's it. Yeah. That's what it all comes that's down it. to. That's the bottom line, unbelief. Yeah. We're judged by the gospel. Paul says, my gospel. So all anybody's going to have to say on judgment is, did you receive the blood payment for your sin or not? That's yeah. it. That's it. Oh, uh, by, the, by the way, um, I, I knew that you'd understand, uh, Renee, when I said adultery, but I'm, I better real, remember that not everybody listening would, would, oh, get, yeah. it, would get it. So let me explain. Yeah. I, I did not mean adultery in the sense of um, uh, uh, a... You, or, uh, having sex outside of your marriage, no uh, oh. adultery, and I don't. I'm not even so sure that in the uh, the commandments when it talks about adultery, I've heard it argued, and I'm not sure they're wrong that uh, thou shalt not commit adultery uh, could be referencing uh, this point I'm making now, and that is uh, having other gods, or whether even whether it's another god 
uh, directly, or whether it's another God in that you're, you're making yourself God, putting faith in your own righteousness. You um, the uh, the uh, adultery, the word adultery means means impure. It's not a hundred percent. It's it's uh, if you, if something is, if you have pure water. Uh, and then I put some, let's say, leaven in it or poison in it. Uh, it's uh, that would be called adulterating it. You're making it impure. It's no longer pure if you mix anything with it. So when Paul is talking about adding law to grace, uh, that, that's committing adultery. In mm. other words, you're it's no longer pure grace and faith. Now it's ruined. It's adulterated. Yeah. So that's that's what I meant when I said adultery is that they they built that golden calf. Uh, instead of instead of believing in the God of uh, Israel, I am so glad that you explained that. I forget sometimes, but you know what? The, the golden calf. I just wanted to remind people you were saying what adultery is is idolatry. Well, you know, the Catholics they bow down or venerate these idols. They hang things, lays around their neck, and put offerings at their feet and kiss the foot of Saint Peter, who's actually Jupiter. It's a statue of Jupiter, same statue, uh, and. Here's the thing. They call them by the right names. They even call their idol of Jesus hanging on the cross, the big statue they have of him, by the right name. Jesus is God. So it's not just worshiping other gods in the sense like you're worshiping Baal or you're a Muslim or you have a different God like the Hindus. But you could say you're worshiping the true God. You could say Jesus Christ, but when you build an idol, because they did that with the golden calf, they said, this is Yahweh who brought us up out of Egypt. This is the God that brought us out of Egypt. So they were saying that that idol they were worshiping was God. So they were giving it the right name, but they were still worshiping an idol, which is another God, even if you call it by the right name. If you're worshiping an idol that is not worshiping him in spirit and in truth, and you are worshiping Satan, but you're throwing God's name on it. That's yeah. how in Catholicism, they have the right names, but they're still worshiping the same demon uh, minor gods through praying to the saints. They're worshiping their virgin child cult through the Virgin Mary baby Jesus thing. And then they're worshiping another God, even though they say it's Jesus when they uh, worship these idols. I just wanted to remind everybody that. Mm. That was worth it. All right. Uh, so, Brother Cripps, uh, I'm going to read that verse, verse 5, uh, in the Amplified, and then give me your thoughts. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with the great majority of them, for they were overthrown and strewn down along the ground in the wilderness. Yeah, and it says, uh, well, the version I'm seeing on the screen, it says, because their lack of self-control led to disobedience, which led to death, for verse 5. That's an interesting addition to that. Um, but, yeah, Renee did a really great job. There's not a whole lot I can add to that except to say that it, can we remember all the different ways in which people were killed off during their time in the wilderness? I mean, at one point, the ground opened up, swallowed up a bunch of them, right? Um, the snakes got a lot of them, you know, the poisonous asps, uh, uh, killing a bunch of them. Um, some of them just, just plain, they, they live long enough to die natural causes before they're ever able to walk through. Uh, but there's several different ways in which they, uh, they died off and were not able to enter. But the bottom line is the ones that entered were not part of the original group, the original generation that came from, from Egypt. Um, and so the ones that did step over, uh, were the ones that, um, that, that had, had the right, uh, focus. And also, uh, it's an example of the, the way that the, the Amplified is saying it, you know, the vast majority of them, uh, didn't make it. And that, to me, that's also a picture um, a lot of people, a lot of people were in the wilderness. A lot of people left Egypt. There, uh, you know, I don't know what the number is. Maybe the Bible gives that number, and I just don't remember. But there, there was a lot of them, and a uh, few of them actually entered in. Uh, but 
uh, your robot. What did you say, Brother Luke? Try again. Um, okay, uh, I thought you were finished. I'm not finished. Uh, no. I, I'm, oh, go ahead. Are you finished? I wasn't finished. You you jumped in with something, and I I thought maybe you knew the number, and we we're going to try to say the number. All right. No, I'll I'll wait till you finish. Then go ahead. No, no, I it, it's okay. Go go ahead with your with whatever you're going to say. It's fine. All right. Well, uh, when you when you say, you mentioned the fact that uh, uh, the great majority of them, and it, it says in the Amplified, um, God was not pleased with the great majority of them. The KJV, it says, but with many of them. Mm -hmm. The NABRE says God was not pleased with most of them. It's it's all really making the same point yeah. that wide is the road to destruction, narrow is the way to, to life. And, and uh, uh, it's always been that way. It all, always will be that way. Another word in the Bible that, uh, that uh, explains this is the word remnant. There's always going to be a little fraction of people that, that have the right kind of faith, uh, and um, the vast majority don't, and so that's why most of them uh, they did not survive this journey through the through the desert for f forty years. Um, okay, um, any, any more on verse five before we move on to verse six? Well, I would suggest letting Jason finish what he was saying on verse five. I offered him the opportunity. All right. I don't well, think you, 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 were, you were roboting. We couldn't really yeah, hear Yeah, that's the reason why. Is you, you, uh, you were roboting, Brother Luke, and I, I wanted to make sure if you were adding something to what I was saying that it, it was clear. Cause, All right. Uh, if, you're, if you have more to say, go ahead. Well, you, you said it. I was just going to say that it, to me it's a shadow of the, the uh, wide road. So you, you, you hit on exactly what my point was going to be. So it, All it right. That's all I was going to add was that it's just, it's another shadow for us to look at and see that uh, the majority of people or most people don't find it. Uh, it's it's the few, it's the remnant, it's the it's the people that really understand uh, that it's uh, Christ alone through faith alone with nothing added. They're not adding their own works. Mm -hmm. That's all. Okay. All right. Let's go to, to verse six in the KJV. Um, now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Mm. Brother Cripps, why don't you go first on this one? Uh, the, now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they lusted. Well, one of the examples is the idol that they made. I mean, is that not lust? Uh, to, you know, uh, if we remember the stories, Moses is uh, in the mountain getting the Ten Commandments, and they waited for him, and they didn't wait very long, and they said, oh, we, you know, what's happened to him? They thought something had happened to him, and he wasn't coming back. So they uh, made Aaron, uh, they gathered all their gold together and made Aaron fashion the gold calf, and they worshipped him and had, uh, had uh, little little parties, um, lusting after each other, lusting after the, the golden calf, and worshipping it, as you said, Brother Luke, putting the name of, of Yahweh on it. Um, yeah, they're they're totally lusting. Um, there are all kinds of ways in which they lusted. You know, when they when they um, went into the desert, they were they were lusting after the the slavery that they were once under. You know, because it was it, to them uh, it, at some point slavery was better than what they didn't know. They're grumbling and complaining about the situation they were in when they were free. They were free of the oppression that they were under. But yes, they're they're yet they're lusting for the for that, and there's a lot that can be said about that because I think that we still do that. We we stick to what we know. A lot of people stick to what they what we know, and we're afraid of the unknown. We're afraid to step out in faith. We're afraid to to uh, move forward in a place where we're not feeling totally secure, not realizing that the place we're in is bondage. The place that God has for us is is uh, freedom. Uh, even in this broken, fallen world, God has a freedom for us. But anyway, that gets off point. Um, yeah, all the examples that we we read in in the story of uh, the Hebrews in in the desert are, are plenty of examples to draw from. Uh, I think Paul's just uh, making a point of it here. He's going to say more. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, all right, Renee. I'm going to read that verse six in the Amplified for you. 
It says, now these things are examples, that is warnings and admonitions for us not to desire or crave or covet or lust after evil and carnal things as they did. Yeah, I, I don't think in and of themselves they were all evil, but it was the lust in their heart after them that made them evil. Right. Uh, and as Brother Jason was saying, they they were lusting after returning to the bondage mm -hmm. that God did all that work to get them out of. Because it, they, they would rather be in comfort. Because they said, oh, remember all those vegetables and spices and fruit that we had? Yeah. You know, at least they fed us good. Like they were lusting after these things that they they think they had but when you're missing something you always make it greater than it is mm -hmm. you know so they were elevating the life that they had before above the life that god had before them right in front of them their glorious future had they just believed god and took him at his word and and had slaughtered the giants and their and all these tribes evil tribes they could have had the promised land. They would have just believed God, but they were always questioning him constantly. And whatever they didn't have, they had to have it. They had manna from heaven and pure water from a spring coming out of a rock in a desert. Yeah. And they were fussing because they didn't have enough meat. So he, God gave them quails until it came out of their nose. Yeah, he you did. Know? It's like every, everything, it just constant uh, uh, they wanted to party too. Remember, they were making the idol, and they would do these pagan rituals. They would fornicate and dance. They would do these sexual dances and play instruments, and uh, you know, wear ear. The women would wear earrings and makeup and do all these pagan rituals, and that's what they would do around these idols. If you look up what these rituals were, they would work themselves up into a sexual frenzy. And and do and that's oh just defiling, you know that holy place. And yeah. so they lusted after evil things, and then they lusted after things that were neutral, were neither good nor evil. But because it was coming from a, a disobedient and ungrateful heart, then it became evil. Yeah. Amen. Well. Um. When, uh, when it says these things were our examples, um, you know, there's other times where we see this term, um, something's given to us as an example. Uh, and we're, we're supposed to basically learn from this thing that happened in the past. Um, Sodom Gomorrah, it said that, that was given, that's an example to us of, of what's, to come, it's a picture of uh, uh, the end. And uh, so we're supposed to learn something from this. Uh, I don't know, uh, I didn't understand what you meant when you said that things were not evil in themselves. Uh, as I'm looking at the list of things that's, that's listed here that they did, um, I'll, I'll read on as we're, uh, so we can continue. It says, neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as it was is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three thousand, uh, three three and twenty thousand. Uh, neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of servant serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Um, so the, the, it gives us, uh, okay, this is an example to you. These are the things uh, that uh, on this list here that are giving us a recount of, of uh, Exodus, of the things that they did that made, it said, but with many of them, God was not well pleased. So God was not well pleased because of these things that they did and this is supposed to serve as an example to us, lest we do these same kinds of things. Uh, all right, so uh, uh, Renee, why don't you go? I read several verses because I thought it was all related there. So go ahead and give me your thoughts on that. Okay. Now, which ones do you want me to? You well, I read, read several. I, I, which ones do you want me to discuss? 
Oh, everything I read. Right up to the, up to the end of uh, nine. Yeah, or was nine. ten the destroyer? I, I remember. I read, I, I read uh, seven through ten. Through ten, okay. I, no, I remember no, the destroyer. No, no, I read seven through nine. Destroyed of the destroyer. Yeah, I remember you saying that. Um, so, uh, like you were saying, that this is, and sometimes it says an ensample or an example. These are uh, shadows, as we were talking earlier, for us to see them as um, to learn from their mistakes, to learn what pleased God, uh, and also to bring these uh, very uh, carnal ordinances into the spiritual realm. So when it says, uh, neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day, three and 20,000, uh, uh, that's when, you know, obviously the, the golden calf um, and they rose up to play. We were talking about that ritual that they committed. I think, well, didn't you make them uh, melt it down and drink it? Yeah. Yeah. True so, they literally uh, ate of their own fornication. Yep. And as Brother Luke was using the word adultery earlier, it's the same thing. The fornication he's talking about here is with another God. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not sexual union here. Uh, and neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. That is when they were murmuring and the, these fiery serpents bit them and this is why that is such a powerful picture when jesus says uh as moses lifted up the bronze serpent so must i be lifted up and i will draw them in unto me because when they were yeah. in of these serpents for their disobedience yeah. if they moses built a bronze serpent so there was a snake on a pole which i believe was a cross and that serpent represented sin that Jesus would become for us. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at the serpent on the pole, which is the sin Christ became for us on the cross. Mm -hmm. And Moses lifted that up and he said, if you look upon this bronze serpent and believe God when he says that death will flee from you, that you will be healed from the serpent bites, mm -hmm. then you will not die. So they looked upon that bronze serpent with faith that they wouldn't die and they did not die. They lived. And that is a picture of us looking at Jesus, yeah. wearing our sin, mm -hmm. believing we will not die the second death with faith and we do not die the second death. We simply believe God. We took him at his word when he said, you shall never die. Mm -hmm. Believe thou this, we say yes. We do believe it. We're not going to die from the serpent's bite. Right. We're not going to die the second death because of the serpent's bite, the sin mm -hmm. that 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 makes us twice dead plucked up by the roots. Yeah. So it's so important that we understand that was a shadow. Uh, I heard John MacArthur twist this so much. He said that they were looking at the bronze serpent. They were crawling on their hands and knees in repentance. Oh, please. None of that is in scripture. It's as simple as believing God when he says, if you look at this, you won't die. And we look at the cross and he says, look at this. Believe this. You won't die. Believe me. Mm -hmm. That's what he says. Um, that whosoever sees the son and believe it on him uh, shall not die. So. Uh, we need to believe on the sun when we see him there on the cross. We believe it. And and that is the simplicity of the gospel. The bronze serpent is the greatest symbol. Um, and so that's what it's talking about when they they uh, were tempted and destroyed of serpents. Uh, and okay, you, you ought to stop there, right? The bronze serpent. As some of right. them were also murmured destroyed of the destroyer all right uh let me read uh six through ten for crypts in the amplified here it says now these things are examples that is warnings and admonitions for us not to desire or crave or covet or lust after evil and carnal things as they did 
Do not be worshipers of false gods, as some of them were. As it uh, is written, uh, the people sat down to eat and drink the sacrifices offered to the golden calf at Horeb mm -hmm. and rose to sport, to dance and give way to jesting and hilarity. We must not gratify evil desire and indulge in immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 suddenly fell dead in a single day. We should not tempt the Lord, that is, try his patience, become a trial to him, critically appraise him, and exploit his goodness, as some of them did, and were killed by poisonous serpents. Nor I'm scratching. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to talk. <laughs> I was yelling at nor, the cat. I'm so sorry I was on. <laughs> nor discontentedly complain, as some of them did, and were put out of the way entirely by the destroyer, that is death. Okay, Crips. Yeah, so um, I had mentioned this on the verse above. Is some of the some of the things that uh, he was he was uh, going to mention, and the thing that I focus on is the how many people died in a single day. Twenty three thousand suddenly oh. fell dead. Um, so uh, again, he's kind of filling in the details that he uh, started at the beginning, and uh, these are all the things that they did. Uh, Renee already kind of uh, talked about this, uh, you know, how they worship the idol and they, uh, this goes into more detail. They sat down to eat and drink, then they rose up to play, which is, of course, is the immoral activities, uh, the dancing around, the ritual dancing and the wearing of uh, earrings and all that stuff, which they knew uh, God didn't like. Uh, and they just did it right in his face. And, and uh, we do that when we live in uh, immorality and uh, we refuse to believe in him. Um, and then I want to just talk briefly and agree with what Renee's saying about, you know, lifting up the, the, the bronze serpent, serpent and uh, all they had to do was, was look at it and believe that they wouldn't die and they didn't die. It's not a bunch of crawling around. It's not changing yourself and making yourself clean before you look at him, before you believe in him. It's coming to him as you are, and you won't die the second death. That's it. And that uh, it's not based on anything that we have to do. I mean, is it such a great uh, trial? Is it is it giving up too much for us simply to lift our heads and look at Christ on the cross, to look at what he did for us, and just believe it? I don't, I don't think it's asking a whole lot, but it's certainly not based on anything that we do. Jesus did all the work. He, he did every bit of it. There's, there's nothing that counts on us. When we make it uh, to, to his, his throne room and they ask the question, you know, what, what, did, did you put your faith in, in Christ or not? Uh, if our answer is yes, then we don't throw anything else in there. We don't say, well, yeah, that, and I did all this great stuff. Yeah, that, and I cleaned myself up. Yeah, that, and I crawled around on the ground, and I was just wrought up with my own wickedness. And that's what that's what saved me, is my willingness to quit quit my sinning. Um, that has nothing to do with it. It's, it's, it's simply what he did. Cripps, I love how he said it, Brother Luke. I love how Cripps said, uh, it's not, you don't get yourself cleaned up to, before you come to them. It's like get yourself well before you go to the doctor. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I want to look at the note footnote in the NABRE, uh, verses six through 13. This says this section explicates the typological value of these Old Testament events. The desert experiences of the Israelites are examples meant as warnings to deter us from similar sins, such as idolatry, immorality, etc., and from a similar fate. Um, I think that is the right way to, to look at this. When it, I, when it says it's given to us as an example, that's what it's meant. But I, I'm curious um, to get your thoughts on verse 9 when it says in the KJV, neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted, 
and were destroyed of serpents. Now, should we should we interpret that that they at that time were tempting Christ? Um, uh, in, in, in the Amplified, it, it, it says, we should not tempt the Lord, that is, try his patience that become a trial to him, critically appraise him and exploit his goodness. But of course, in the KJV, it specifically says, let, neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted. So I'm, I'm wondering, am I reading too much in there that uh, should I take it that uh, they also tempted Christ or he says, neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also were, were guilty of tempting, but not Christ, but the Lord, the Lord as they understood him. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, Renee, do you want to you go or I'll go? <laughs> go right ahead, Chris. Yeah, so uh, right at the beginning, this is this is what this passage, he, Paul started this passage about that, uh, as, as we mentioned, or as I mentioned, uh, when it came around to me of uh, a lot of people not understanding that Christ has been there the whole time. In fact, if you hear from some people, they, they would uh, take Christ completely out of the Old Testament and say that he, he didn't exist. Uh, and they do that for wicked reasons so that they can put themselves on the same, the same level of, as him and become little Christ. Uh, they, they try to take away his divinity and make it be that she was just a man and nothing more and that, that he, he was not uh, God before the foundations of the world. And that's just, that, that's a lie straight from the pit. So um, Paul is, is opening this uh, chapter up by talking about the, the cloud and the rock and all that and referring to him as being Christ. Um, so as, as Renee said right at the beginning when she came in, can you make it any more clear than that? So no, Brother Luke, I don't think you're going too far. Um, the the uh, Paul uses the word Christ here. So uh, whether they understood it then or not is beside the point, and whether people understand it now or not is beside the point. It was Christ. Christ was the rock. Christ was the cloud. Christ was all the things uh, in the Old Testament leading up to the point which he was put into a physical body and he, he walked the earth and he went on the cross and died and was resurrected. That was the same one that without him, nothing was made from the very beginning of time. Um, so he's introducing this concept, whether it's the first time or not that Paul uh, did this, I'm not, I'm not uh, aware, uh, but he is introducing that concept, how people miss it, how they can't see that it was the same from the beginning. Yes, there was the law, but we were saved before the cross, we were saved by the shadow of Christ to come, by the promise of the coming Messiah. So he has been involved since before the foundations of the world. He's still involved now, and he'll be involved in the end when he returns. So it's always been about him. Um, people can say it's about, well, it's, it was about the law, but now it's not about the law anymore. It, it, it's about him. It's always been about him. It's just that, it, you know, the law had to come into place to shut our mouths and to show us that we need a savior. And then we look forward to that savior. Adam and Eve knew what they were looking forward to. They knew that there was a promise of Messiah that would save them from the horrible predicament they put themselves in. Uh, and, and and they knew that. Adam preached that, I believe. I believe that that that, that was passed along uh, generation to generation of the shadow of Christ that's come, the shadow of the Redeemer. Um, it, it's always been a part of it. Okay. All right, thanks. Um, I'm looking at the chat room and uh, I think a switch is uh, made a couple of comments that perhaps we're not um, uh, understanding it uh, enough, the reference to the serpent. Uh, and, and that uh, because we haven't mentioned anything about, well, what about the serpent in the garden? Should we relate this back to that? Um, are, are, are they connected? Is, is that possibly the reason that uh, this is this is illustrated in that way? A serpent on a pole um, being a picture of sin put on the cross. Right. Jesus was, became sin for us. So. Right. 
Jesus on the cross as his sin is on the cross. Right. But uh, do you think that we we should go back and and, and reference the um, the serpent in the garden? And, and well, that's where this? I get the symbology from, Luke. I mean, I didn't. I should have explained it, but I didn't. I just said this serpent represents sin, but we automatically symbolically represent Satan is always represented by a dragon or a serpent because yeah. he's called that old serpent called the devil, and it's associated with original sin so when i say that you know when i said it represents sin that jesus became i i think that's exactly where you know the symbology came what do you think yeah i think it's it's fair to to relate it back to that uh, uh i'm 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 remembering um going way back in time when shortly after I got saved and reading the Bible and I read about that, I, I remember being disturbed by this, this idea of uh, this supposed to be representing Jesus on the cross. And yet it's a serpent. I didn't get it at that, that point in my uh, understanding. Uh, I understand, I understand it now, but uh, it, it did bother me many, many years ago because I didn't really I'd see how Jesus could be pictured as as a serpent. Is well, we'll learn more as we as we time goes on. Hopefully, um, all right. Let's continue back uh, into the KJV, looking now at verse uh, eleven. Uh, now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Okay, Brother Cripps, will you go first on that? Sure. So all these things happen. And okay, so uh, again, he started out by saying these are examples. And I think we've we've uh, gone over these examples. We've talked about the examples enough. Um, they're written for admonition. So these, these are written for our own good, our own learning, so that we can uh, make these connections, the connections that we're making uh, as we amplify this. Uh, they're made to help us. They're they're made to uh, uh, help us avoid uh, falling into the same mistake. That's what Paul wants here. He wants us to to hear this story and to walk away from it and uh, have more information than we did when we started, and to not put ourselves into the same position. I love the way this ends. Maybe the Amplified would uh, would describe it better than I can. But upon whom the ends of the world are come, the ends of the world. Um, we know that Christ is returning, you know, uh, he, he's not finished. Uh, now, the, all the work he's done for salvation is finished, but uh, his story is not over. His story, uh, he, there's, there are still events that will take place, and it will be the end of this world as we know it. Um, this world will pass away, and all things uh, become new, and he's, he's the one that makes all things uh, become new. Uh, but essentially, he is the end of the world. He he will come back and uh, punish the wicked, and so we have that to look forward to. And for us, we have the uh, the changing into our eternal uh, eternal bodies, and um, we have the the uh, finishing of our faith, which which he commits. He finishes our faith. He gives us the fruits. Uh, of the faith that we put in him in the end, which is our eternal gift, our eternal bodies and whatever else um, that doesn't get burned up in the fire, all those things. But he's the reason for it. Um, I think that's what he's referring to. I could be wrong, but uh, I'll, I'll I'll wait for the Amplified or for one of you to explain, but that's what it seems like to me. All right, uh, Renee, I'll read it. Verse 11 in the Amplified. It says, now these things befell them by way of a figure, that is, as an example and warning to us. They were written to admonish and fit us for right action by good instruction. We, in whose days the ages have reached their climax, their consummation and concluding period. Yeah, I, I think... Um even though he's talking specifically about idolatry here, the sin of pride is uh, a reference, a, a veiled, uh, implied reference here, because he says, um, you know, all these things happen for examples, you know, like you were saying, shadows, pictures, 
uh, written for our admonition so we can learn from them upon whom in the end the worlds are come. Uh, so it seems if you go right above, neither murmur ye, don't tempt Christ. If some of them tempt him, were destroyed. Don't murmur. If some of them murmur, where you're destroyed by the destroyer. So since, although he's talking about idolatry, a lot of this uh, seems to be about the sin of pride, which is idolatry in itself. Uh, and he's saying, uh, don't get puffed up now. Don't think just because you're that you're with God, you know, you're in Christ, you're with God that, you know, it's all good. It is all good, but, but don't get puffed up in yourself because I, he's, I, in the, if you read the whole thing, it seems like he's trying to point them back to Christ and his grace, um, lest they, uh, get puffed up in some kind of way. And cause it says, don't tempt him. Like don't push it, you know? Um, because they are not above the same error. Because when we, a lot of us, when we read the things done in the Old Testament or sin that people did, we would go, oh, I would never do that. If I was Adam and Eve, I wouldn't do that. We get all prideful thinking we wouldn't do that. Well, you know, they tempted God. Don't you tempt God. And I, by the way, I love when he says, don't tempt Christ. Because this Christ is the same God that they tempted in the Old mm -hmm. Testament. Mm -hmm. So the same consequence can fall upon you if you fall into the same error. Mm -hmm. That's why he's saying these things are an example for us. So we don't make the same mistakes and come under the same problems that they had. So I think that there's an underlying thing of pride here that they... You know, don't think you're not you're not able to fall into these sins because you are. And it all leads to the terrible sin of idolatry. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, all of us have been accused and continue to be accused of uh, teaching people they have a license to sin. And of course, anybody who has uh, been uh, paying attention and with this congregation any length of time, you you, you know that we uh, we're saying that our behavior does not determine our salvation. In other words, saved by be believing, not by behaving. Uh, but um, but but the way we live our lives uh, are still remain relevant. We 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 are not saying it makes no difference how you live your life. And um, uh, we'll take verses like these when it says now twice, he says these are examples to us so that we don't make the same kinds of mistakes that they made and uh, suffer consequences. You know, uh, we say all the time that um, if we sin, we will, we will not suffer the consequence of not going to heaven, but sin does bring its own consequences. Every sin has consequences with it. And so um, these, this is an example to us, to teach us as a warning to us, uh, admonition to us, don't get into idolatry, don't get into fornication and all, all the kind of things here that they're saying, uh, these are examples so that we don't make those same mistakes. If you do, it doesn't, it's not related to whether we're saved or not. It's related to, hey, you're not going to get away with sin. No one gets away with their sin. You're, you will you will have consequences that, that uh, are attached to the sin, and you also have um, uh, somehow God, uh, if you are saved, God does chastise us. And, of course, the, you know what does that mean? And I, we're all have a different way of, I think, uh, understanding how, what this chastisement is. I think that the chastisement is, um, uh, if we picture Jesus as a shepherd and he has a staff and we're the sheep, that the, I, I don't know of any shepherds that use the staff to beat the sheep. No. Uh, the stepper, shepherds use it to steer and direct the sheep to get them going in the right direction. Yeah. So I, I, that's how I would think that God is, uh, is chastising us when, when we're going off, off track uh, uh, so God will uh, redirect us with this, this chastisement. The sin also will cause us to stop because we're going to suffer from, from the regular consequences of sin. Uh, 
Well, I've All heard right. people say, Brother Luke, that they break the sheep's legs, that the chastisement is breaking their legs so they don't they, they don't run wander off. Well, yeah. Well, I guess it, You've it, got to be kidding me. Yeah. Uh, no. I have never heard something so horrific. Yeah. No, they, they do actually do that to... That um, is horrible. They, they do that to sheep who leave the herd wow. over and over and over again because the because the shepherd will always go after that one mm -hmm. and he always does but if he has to do it over and over and over again he breaks the legs and he'll actually carry the sheep the whole time that it heals but it doesn't go off anymore that is horrible to say that god does that to his children you know yeah. Oh no, no. I I hear what you're saying. I'm just saying that's that's a practice that oh, sheep herders golly, do. Both are horrible. It's just all horribleness. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, all right. Let's uh, unless any more needs to be said on those, we'll go on to verse twelve in the in the in the KJV. Sure. Uh, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Boom. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, Brother Cripps? Yeah, that one's a good one. That one's easy, too. I mean, you, you touched on a little bit, Brother Luke. But, um, yeah, it's just let's not be all high and mighty and think that, that we can't fall in the same sin that, the, that the, the folks in the wilderness did. Because I've done that. You know, I, <laughs> I've often thought about these people, and I thought, okay, putting myself in the same situation. If I'm a slave... I'm literally a slave in Egypt. And Moses comes along and says, you let my people go. I'm one of God's people. And I may not fully understand even what that means. I grew up in Egypt as a slave. And I, you know, I'm hearing about other gods and, and seeing all these, these foreign ways of doing things. But this guy is saying that, that, he, that God said to, to set his people free. And I'm one of his people. And then so I get let out of my, my little hut and then we walk, we, we walk for a long time, and then we come up against the sea, and then the soldiers are coming to get us back. And then so God opens up the sea and makes it possible for us to walk across on dry ground to the other side and then close the sea up on the, on the soldiers again. And then he leads us through the desert with, uh, with, a, with, a, with a cloud and uh, a, a fire. It was a fire. It was a fire by night, cloud during the day, fire by night. Yeah, pillar of fire. Yeah, pillar of fire, which are miraculous. That's not something I saw every day in Egypt. So he delivered me from slavery, opened up the sea so I could go go through on on dry ground, and then uh, leads us with this cloud and fire through the desert. And then I'm gonna go. Oh well, no, we we want to make a golden calf and we want we want to you know mess around while uh, Moses is up there getting the law for us. Um, I don't get it. If I saw all those things, I like to tell myself, if I saw all those things, I would believe that you wouldn't need to convince me with, with any anything else. That would be enough for me. And in the same way, if if, if I lived the life of, uh, of uh, Moses and I'm out herding sheep and uh, this bush starts talking to me, the bush is on fire, but the bush isn't consumed and and the voice is telling me, you know, I, I've got some work for you to do. I would believe it. Hmm. I would believe the signs that these these people saw. But the truth is, even if I had seen all those things, the, the point is that we're all capable of failing, no matter what it is that he shows us in our lives. And I'll make that same example. How often has God delivered you in your own life? And during that time, you're like, oh, thank you, God. I was in this place and I didn't know I didn't know how I was going to get out of it, and and you you made things happen in a way to deliver me. How long do you remember that experience? And I'm saying that to myself because he's done it on on several occasions in my life, and I'll remember it right then while it's still fresh in my mind. But a couple of years go by, and another situation comes comes up, and I'm saying, how am I going to get out of this one? You know, oh my gosh, this is terrible. Get into this anxiety and stuff. And the more and the more this happens, the more seasoned I become. And then when these things come up, then I know, well, God's delivered me before, so I'm not going to look at just the circumstances because he's going to deliver me. But the point is, God is with us. He will deliver you. Whatever you're facing, he will deliver you. 
and he's making us stronger. The tribulations of this world, they, they bring up uh, uh, patience and experience and all that creates hope. He says that in Romans 5. Tribulation worketh experience, experience, um, tribulation worketh experience and experience hope. Um, so we, we can all fall into these things. Don't, don't look at what they, the, what, what they did and what they said and think, well, you know, I'm better off than they are. I'm not ever going to fall into those things. Now, that's a lot for one small verse, but he's saying, let's not think it, that we can stand uh, because we, we can fall. We absolutely can fall. So don't hold yourself up in this place thinking that you can't fall in these same things because you can't. Mm -hmm. Okay, before we go on, let me ask if anybody could um, help me with the end of the verse 11 when it says, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Anybody? Yeah, give me just a second because I think I, I have an idea here of what it's saying. I think it's um, uh, talking about the consummation of everything being fulfilled. I'll read it in the Amplified. It says, we in whose days the ages have reached their climax, that is their consummation and concluding period. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I touched on it. I, I, I believe it's when, when Christ returns and he finishes, finishes the work that, that he has yet yeah. to do, including our eternal bodies and raising the dead and all that stuff, punishing the wicked, all that whole thing is wrapped up in that verse, in my opinion. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because uh, it says it happened to them, but for our admonition upon whom the ends of the worlds are come. So, yeah, it is consummation. I think the same thing Jason does. Probably you do, too. Uh, it's talking about uh, because world is sometimes interchangeable with age, mm -hmm. end of the age, end of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think it's saying this is what happened back then. And they were destroyed, right? That was how it concluded. That was the consummation of the mm -hmm. example yeah. of the sample. But here it is played. That was a shadow. But yeah. here's how it's going to play out uh, upon the end of the age is, is coming upon us. Um, and we don't want the same result of destruction that it happened to the example. Uh, because we as as believers some of them will actually be here when the end of the age is is come and so we want to keep these things that they did and how they failed and and uh help to help lead us yeah. because we will be yeah same thing to, for the consummation so he's just saying uh and then when we bring it into the wherefore let him think he standeth lest there's the pride that I was talking about. I think that it's the idolatry, but also uh, he's warning them to not get prideful. It's like Jason was saying that we're we're no better than them, but we're we think uh, we're we're not gonna we're not gonna do anything that stupid. Right. You no, know, we, we we you know, but we we hindsight's twenty twenty. You know how often have we? had uh, something miraculous happen to us, like an amazing prayer get answered, yet we'll worry about the exact same thing as if he's not going to show up for us next time and forget that, you know? So I, I think um, the, the beware because we think we're, we're prideful. We think we're, we're better. We think yeah. we're better and it can't happen to us. And I, I love that it's referring to tempting Christ because it really is the same God they dealt with. And mm -hmm. we don't want to make the same mistakes they made and get the same results they got. No yeah. the way, it wasn't eternal damnation. He's not even talking about eternal salvation, eternal destruction. He's talking about the physical destruction of their, their bodies. Yeah. Um, well, we do have a footnote on this ver on that poor part of verse eleven. But uh, as I'm reading it, I I need to explain the footnote to me. Uh, let's hear. It, it says um, the the portion that says upon whom the end of the ages has come is it is our period in time toward which past ages have been moving, 
and mm -hmm. in which they arrive at their goal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wait, that's what both Jason and I were saying. It's consummated. The, mm -hmm. All of this stuff we saw as an example has been working up to, the, they were all shadows of what the actual consummation of those shadows will be. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. believers will be here at the end of the age. It's all consummated, but we don't want to make <coughs> things they mm -hmm. made during their time of testing and have the same results of destruction that they had because it's the, it's kind of full circle. It's that was a shadow. This is what they did. And this is what they got. We are the consummation of that shadow and we don't want to do what they did and get what they got this time around. So it's the, I remember reading verse 12, but I don't remember anybody uh, commenting on it. Uh, I think Cripps did say something. And so let me get your thoughts, Renee, on, on verse 12. It says, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Yeah, that's why I said it's about pride, thinking we won't, we're, we're not going to make those mistakes. Mm -hmm. We won't make the same mistakes they make. And so pride, in a sense, is a form of idolatry. It's self-worship. Yeah. Uh, I think everything points back to Paul bringing them to faith in Christ, keeping all their trust in Christ, not in themselves, not in false gods, not in ritual, not in anything. Uh, but the whole the whole chapter is focused on idolatry and how that the shadow of the of Israel and their mistakes. But uh, here, I I think he's just you know don't tempt him. Don't think you're going to, don't get puffed up now. Don't think you aren't capable of doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, 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 it's time to finish, but I'm going to read verse 13 and then to, we'll talk about that. And that's it. I, okay. For time's sake, it says, there hath no temptation. You, uh, you, well, my sir, there hath no temptation taken you but such as is common to man but god is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it mm, praise god okay sister renee you want to go on that yeah one? You know, a lot of people use this verse to say it's talking about all sin. I, I really think this is about pride and idolatry because that's what it's talking about before and after the verse. And although he is talking about uh, uh, Israel and the mistakes they made with idolatry and not believing God, I think this reference is saying uh, don't be tempted to lose your faith. Because this whole thing is about them not believing God, not uh, trusting in him, and then going to other gods and their idolatry. So the temptation here, and then it closes with flee from idolatry. So I, I think that this is uh, uh, warning them to not be tempted uh, to lose faith, to stop trusting in Christ. Because uh, it says there's no temptation taken you with such as common to man. God is faithful. So, uh, you know, he's confirming uh, that your your faith is founded. It's um, He's faithful. He's not going to suffer you to be tempted that which you're able. But with the temptation, make way to escape that you're able to bear it. I think this is about um, uh, keeping faith in God through trials um, to, the, to that you're, you're never going to have a situation to where God uh, isn't going to show up in a way that's going to hurt your faith, <clears throat> that your your faith can't survive it. You know, uh, I really do, because when you look at the surrounding context, it's not talking about sin in general. It's it's um, talking about staying faithful to Christ uh, and and not falling into idolatry and pride, which is a form of idolatry. It's self worship. So the temptation that's common to man is whatever trial that you endure. But God is faithful. You see, He's like again confirming that He's worthy of the faith. Mm -hmm. So I don't think this is necessarily talking about sin in general. Like He'll never let you be tempted 
with uh, it, with porn to the point where you couldn't just say no to it. Or if you're a heroin addict, he'll never let you can walk away from that heroin. You know, I don't think that's what that's referring to here. I really think this is about uh, you'll no temptation uh, is taking you such as common to man. Look, you're not going to endure any trial uh, that that your faith shouldn't shouldn't remain in God. It, it, it won't destroy your faith. He's not going to suffer you. He's not going to allow you to uh, endure something that's going to completely destroy your faith. That's why he says, but God is faithful. So I, I think, I mean, it's possible it's talking about sin in general, but I really think the, uh, the context here is more about uh, the temptation to fall away from faith and to, to fall into trusting something else ourselves or another god or, or something possible i don't know i could um, be wrong I, I i i think the context of everything preceding is talking about all these sins uh idolatry uh fornication and uh, uh all the things that were listed earlier so um, but wasn't I, the fornication going around other gods well it yeah but that's not that, but fornication is not uh, or no, not fornication. The idolatry, I think, would be, but not for, fornication was actual sexual sin that we're. No, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let's go back there. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed and fell in one day. The reason they that uh, twenty three thousand, uh, three and twenty thousand fell. Twenty three thousand people fell. That they died was because they committed fornication with uh, another god. That's why they, they, they chose, remember, they split them off. Who's going to stay with God and who's going to leave? And those people decided to leave God. I believe that's what happened that day. I so, thought the fornication was with another God. That's how I've been reading it all this time. So if that's not the case, I want to I want to know because I, and I completely have to change my idea of what that one of the verse means. Well, that verse 8 in the Amplified says, uh, we must not gratify evil desire and indulge in immorality as some mm -hmm. of did. And 23,000 suddenly fell dead in a single day. 23,000 did not die because they had sex with other people. It's the whole thing to me. I, I'm not trying to. Uh, I think that commentary is. I could be wrong, but I I really think the fornication here is talking about being with other gods. I could be wrong. I'll check. I'll check for us. Verse eight, in in the NABRE, the verse eight says, "Let us not indulge in immorality as some of them did." In twenty three thousand fell within a single day. Um, I, I don't think it's talking about. Uh, faith I, but that's fine uh i wanted to uh, read the verse 13 in the amplified uh, it really amplifies it crips uh okay. verse 13 you know is a verse that's cited quite often by people sure is, yeah. in the kjv mm -hmm. uh and there's a lot to it but and if you read it in the amplified it's it, you talk about amplifying so here here goes <laughs> For no temptation, that is, no trial regarded as enticing to sin, no matter how it comes or where it leads, has overtaken you and laid hold on you that is not common to man. That is, no temptation or trial has come to you that is beyond human resistance, mm -hmm. and that is not uh, adjusted and adapted and belonging to human experience. And such as man can bear. Mm -hmm. There, God, translated. I'm sorry. But God is faithful to his word and to his compassionate <laughs> nature. Mm -hmm. And he can be trusted not to let you be tempted and tried and assayed beyond your ability and strength to resist, of resistance and power to endure. Mm -hmm. But with the temptation, he will always uh, also a way out, the means of escape to landing uh, to a landing place that you may be capable and strong and powerful to bear up under it patiently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's, it's absolutely possible that that verse is is talking about all sin. It was just a thought. But the other one about the 23,000, that fornication is not talking about sexual immorality. The commentator saw the word fornication and just put sexual immorality there because they assume that's what it was. If you look it up, uh, look at that whole section. You will see it had nothing to do with them 
sexually fornicating with other people. It was that they turned against God. So I did want to clarify that. I think the commentators actually saw the word fornication and assumed it was literal sexual immorality as opposed to spiritual. Well, if you look at verse 6, though, in the, in the KJV, uh, it, it says, Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after mm -hmm. evil things as they also lusted. Mm -hmm. Um, lusting after evil things, uh, I, I don't think that's talking about the uh, 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 going going to the different God. I think that's talking about the flesh lust against the spirit. Yeah. So. Um, all right, Crips, did you talk about thirteen after I read it, or you didn't talk? No, about I it? no, I did. Uh, Renee had a couple things to add, so I, I haven't done it yet. Um, thir thirteen. Uh, I've always felt like this refers to just just sin, sin in general, um, not to disagree with what Renee is saying. I mean, the, there, there may be some truth about the word fornication and all that. Um, but in the, in the passage, it is talking about, uh, I, I've always understood that they, did, they did have sex. They did have sex with each other. Uh, they worshiped, they put the, as Renee said, put the, uh, uh, earrings in and they probably dressed, they put their best dresses on and all that. Um, I look at it as him being angry about the entire thing. Of course he's angry about adultery. It's not just one thing. I think that's the point, that it's several things that they did that were all sin and that uh, made God angry. I mean, I, I think he's most angered by the adultery because he is the one and only God. And so if you're making a golden calf, of course he's going to be angry about that. But the point about this verse um, I've understood it more as I've gotten older and more mature. And when things come up that are tempting to me and that I have sinned before in the past, if it comes up, I know that there's a way out because I believe him. I have faith in him, at least at this point, enough to know that I don't have to step into, into temptation. I don't have to step into sin. That there's a moment, and, and sometimes I'll even look for the door out. When something comes up, someone tries to get me to do something that I know is wrong, I'm looking for the door because I believe him. I believe there's going to be a way for me to to escape that uh, whatever that particular temptation is. And and when I look back at all the sins that I've committed, the ones that I'm aware of, the ones that I know, and I look back at what it did to my life, and I look back and I try to remember what it was that went through my mind before I decided to do something that I knew was wrong. There were definitely ways I could have escaped. I'm just being honest. There are ways that I could have escaped. I could have said no. I could have turned around, got back in my vehicle and drove away. Um, there are any number of things that I can, I, I, I could speak openly about, of things that I have done in my life, that there was a way out. <clears throat> I, I'm not saying in any way that you know people that are addicted to heroin they should just put they they should just be able to put it down. That's not <laughs> what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that each each person as they walk with God, it becomes easier, in my opinion, from what I've learned in my own life. As we walk with Him, as He grows us and teaches us, and He makes us into the likeness of Christ, which is a process for most people. It didn't happen overnight for me. Maybe for you it did. For me, it's a process. He's working in me. Yep. So some of the same things that when I was a much younger and stupider man that I engaged in, I do not engage in now because I've learned from it. I've learned from the consequences that befell me because of the decisions I made. And when something happens now, I look for the, the, the exit door. And he provides it. He remains faithful. I think I agree with y'all uh on that i always try to look at things and and stick to the just specific context but i think this is i think you're both right a very general admonition for sin in general and i agree with you we can always look back and go i could have made a different choice and i believe that uh however i do i do i did find something because that was really bugging me i want to i want to read you this about the twenty three thousand. uh uh, the plague which came upon the people was because they attached themselves to the false god by all pure. Uh, and the adultery fornication is that they served idols rather than the true God. 
this is referenced in first corinthians 10 uh and it says be careful reading recognizing some of the details uh of the two records um the twenty three thousand lost their lives uh because of um uh worshiping other gods so uh but i think that you guys so i believe i believe that's my opinion it could be literal here but i believe in when they were doing the idolatry that they would have done some sexually immoral stuff because they did that during pagan rituals we talked about that earlier so that's very possible that that did occur but what i just wanted to say i felt the fornication was actually spiritual here doesn't mean i'm right it's just i i remember that being in uh uh in this story but i think you're both right on the temptation thing and i wanted to flip that jason brother luke he was talking about how he can look back and say you know i could have done this differently i could god did make a way of escape for me and i agree with him on that but i also know how many times has the devil done the exact opposite when you're doing well and you're determined to serve god to put dangle that one carrot of temptation that always hits you like you will be sober out of rehab doing great just got a new job you're starting your life over and then you're drinking buddy you run into him like you just happen to run into the guy that you got high with all the time mm -hmm. you know what i mean mm -hmm. so whereas god makes a way of escape i think satan always throws the our greatest temptation and you know before us to sure. trip us up you know? Sure, it's a no-brainer, and the familiar spirits know exactly what what we were tempted by oh. what we to do before. And of yeah. course, they're gonna they're gonna whisper in that person's ear and say, "Hey, there's your buddy. Remember all the good times you had? Yeah, it'd be no problem. You're doing well. You can you can just stop at one drink, or you don't have to do what he does." Blah blah blah. Yeah, yeah of course, of course, he's gonna throw the thing up on the opposite end of the spectrum. He's gonna throw the thing up that's gonna try to to make you fall. So I agree with y'all. I think that verse can be talking about sin in general. Absolutely. Well, uh, what what we're trying to do tonight and every night is, is uh, hash it all out together, figure mm -hmm. it out together. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, ho hopefully we're all uh, willing to listen to <laughs> each other and, and sometimes say, hey, uh, that's a perspective that I didn't consider or Sure. And, um, all right. Um, the um, that last verse, though, I'll give you my thoughts. What came to my mind, and then and then we'll be finished here, I guess, uh, except for our, our final remarks. Um, we we the scripture tells us that when we're tempted, that we're going to always be in a position so that we have a way out. We do not have to give in to the temptation. Mm -hmm. That's a promise. Yeah, and see, I one of the things that really bothers me uh, in on the internet, uh, not in this congregation. I'm not seeing it at all, and that's what I'm thankful for. But I, I see many others on the internet, and they're professing Christ, and the 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 blatant sin that they do all the time in terms of uh, you know, their, their their behavior is, is so abhorrent. That it's hard for me to to even believe that they're really saved. Now I know that seems to contradict the whole doctrine of faith alone. Uh, I'm not saying that they're not saved because they have bad behavior, but I can't help but wonder uh, about people. Uh, how could a Christian behave in such a way? And this is like I stub my toe. I'm, I'm doing. I stub my toe on a regular basis in, in in my living room. The way my wife has the furniture arranged and stuff. Sometimes there's this one particular place I stub my toe, and when I do it, it's very painful. And sometimes, um, uh, I, especially when I'm frustrated because I continue to to, to make that mistake, uh, I I lose my temper. Now, I, is that a sin? I maybe maybe it is. Get, losing my temper and, and uh, maybe even screaming out something that I wouldn't normally say. Um, this is a this is an impulsive thing that I I, I think that uh, any Christian 
uh, in, uh, dwell with the Holy Spirit living in them, the Holy Spirit transforming their desires over a lifetime still has these impulsive things that, that we just can't help the way we react. It's a spontaneous reaction. This kind of thing I, I understand. Uh, I still, I can't get over it myself. But what I don't understand is, let, let's use the example of a, of a fornicator or an adulterer. Um, I know that, by the way, it's late, so I'm going to say things I wouldn't want to say if there's, if there's children, children around, but I know that nobody just slips on a banana, falls down, and discovers that they are in coitus with another person. It doesn't happen like that. And that, you know, people will say, well, I cheated on my wife because it just happened. No, <laughs> it doesn't happen like that. <laughs> it, You're like, it, whoops, oh, I'm sorry, I had to get here. Yeah, <laughs> it, 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 you don't just fall down and discover that you're in adultery with someone. You know, there are many things that have to happen, many doors that you have to open one after another and go through. There has to be a, a, a look and a, a note. You notice someone who is, you feel is attractive, and then maybe there's a a, a, a little smile, and then and then and then the uh, a, a little friendly conversation, uh, and and then uh, maybe a little touch on the shoulder or something. I hope this does not sound familiar, like I'm familiar with doing this, but I'm just, I'm trying to give you a series of things that one thing leads to the next. But, uh, uh, and then the conversation and this, the recognition that there's some kind of an attraction, a, a mutual attraction. Uh, and, and then uh, then maybe it leads to some kind of a plan and a date. And, and then what I'm saying is that um, all these things are temptations and each one of them, Along the way, maybe there's five or 10 or 20 or 30 different steps along the way that lead up to this event. And all that time, we have every, every opportunity, is an opportunity to say no. It's not too much of a temptation that we, we can't overcome it. So when I see people who name Christ as their savior, and they are conspiring and planning to do evil to other believers here on the internet, uh, it just blows my mind. I'm asking myself, how could someone with the Holy Spirit not just stub their toe and, and yell out, uh, you know, something they regret, but actually plot and scheme and plan and do something that is very elaborate, one step after the next, to do evil to other people's ministries? That's what blows me away because I know, according to this verse. And no matter if they're tempted to do these things, there's plenty of opportunities along the way that they don't have to succumb to that temptation. I'm sorry. Okay. That's my, uh, is it a pet Agreed. peeve? Agreed. Agreed. It's, it's more than a pet peeve. It's something that very ang angers me, but okay. Uh, let's give our summary thoughts, unless you want to say anything more about this verse before we finish up. Nope. Uh, can I can I go ahead? Just say yes, it. Do. Okay. Uh, well, this chapter is Old Testament being revealed. I love it, love it, love it. I also love it that we can, like, I didn't look at this chapter before we started tonight, so I'm figuring it out as we go along. And so I say my thoughts as we're reading it. And then I listen to what they say. I you know what? I'm going to be wrong with this. I think they're right. And I like that I can say my thoughts without somebody going that's ridiculous you know yeah. it's obvious it says this you know, let me work it out let's reason together yeah. and and the goal is to come to like mind but like on the other issue we might not be in like mind on that and we totally didn't snap each other's heads off and the world didn't end and i'm not going to hang up and expose luke and cribs or you know it's just it's i think it's a good example that when we disagree or we're working things out, we didn't even really disagree. I'm trying to work things out. I have an idea. I want to think about it. I want to look at scripture. I want to hear what, because I'm always looking at things from all angles. I want to see maybe there's something I haven't seen here before, you know? And so I appreciate that Luke and Griff's allow me that process without me feeling pressured that I better hurry up and get right with the program or I'm going to have an enemy quick. You know, and oh not so dogmatic about everything. Uh, and so I think this is a, a good example because, like Brother Luke said, dogmatism is the worst problem. 
Oh yeah. Besides hypocrisy and legalism, dogmatism is insane. You you can't disagree on anything. I mean, people disfellowship you if you don't agree when the rapture is. I mean, it's, it's crazy to me. So I love this chapter. I love the Old Testament coming to life. I love how it confirms Jesus's divinity. I love how it just, you can't get clearer than that rock was Christ. I mean, that is just as clear as you can get. And it just goes to show you that people will put man's tradition before God's clear word, because you can show a Catholic that verse and they will still fight to the death to tell you that Peter's the rock that the church is built on. You know, I, I love when things are that clear, but I love how the Old Testament comes to life. And I love you guys. Happy to be here. Yeah. The, uh, the idea of uh, reasoning together is, is what we're doing. And, and uh, we're trying to work it out and we're studying together. We're learning together. I'm, I'm a, we all learn from each other every time. Oh, that, yeah. And that's the way it's, it's supposed to be. Yeah. Uh, Brother Cripps, give me your summary, please. Yeah, mine will be fairly short because uh, we're running a little bit late. So um, I will uh, make my comments and say goodnight, and then I'll, I'll have to head off, unfortunately. So I'm not uh, trying to be rude. Uh, but, uh, yeah, another amazing study. And I, I'm so glad, Renee, that you feel safe because I would never be one – that would want to ever make you feel pressure to to say things the way I think you should say it or anything like that. In fact, um, I, I love that you look at scripture. We should all look at scripture and challenge ourselves. I, and I agree that being dogmatic is, uh, it's one of the worst things we can do. And I don't wanna ever be like that. I wanna be open to grow and change because I believe the Holy Spirit is trying to grow us and change us. And it's not by listening to just what we were uh, hand fed growing up and just stick with one thing and not be challenged by it. Um, I, I do these, I do these broadcasts and it, it's, it's for his glory and for my edification as well. And um, I am edified every single time. There's not been one, uh, one of these studies that I didn't walk away thinking something uh, new or thinking something that it, uh, uh, made me bolder in my faith. So these are these are great. And uh, just in closing, I would say um, the, all all we have to do is taste that living water. So all we have to do is taste the living water, and we will never go back to anything else. And I would agree, uh, Brother Luke, that the the people that are that are making these choices, they do have a choice. And so it's clear to me what they're choosing from. They're not choosing from the spirit that's been quickened in them that, that brings them to focus on things that are good and lovely and of good report and uh, anything anything of be of any virtue or any praise, think on these things. They're not doing that. So it's clear to me they're acting out of out of purely out of their own their own flesh and um, not out of the spirit. Um, uh, so I appreciate you guys. I love you too, Renee. I love you, brother Luke and everyone in the chat. And I hope you guys have a great evening. Hendrix, stay 30 seconds. I mean, uh, Hendrix, uh, Crips, stay 30 seconds more. Uh, that's all I'm going to take. Um, uh, uh, I'm just going to ask everybody to pray for my friend, uh, that is one of my oldest friends in my life. I've known him for 50 years and he's in the hospital right now. I, uh, I've been telling him about Jesus for 33 years, and uh, he, as he's getting older and sicker, he's much more interested than he used to be, but uh, he's in the hospital, and they're trying to decide if they're going to have to do the bypass surgery on his heart, the, the surgery that I had. His name is Mike, so please, everybody, pray for him, and everybody, don't forget to join us Friday night, 9.30 Eastern, Fellowship Friday. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.